Hello and welcome aboard the Talking Texans podcast, episode number eight. I am Paul Gallant of ESPN 97.5 and 92.5. You can hear my show, The Paul Gallant Show, 10 to noon every single day on that radio station. And joining me is the Houston Texans beat writer for ESPN, DJ Yenime. DJ, what is up? Texans mandatory mini camp was on the docket this week for the Houston Texans. I feel like we got to start by talking about the quarterbacks, but what's up, DJ? I'm doing good, man. You know, just ready to talk some Texans. Um, I've been staring at like this ball, like this, this right here. Cause like when I have the cap on backwards, it makes it look like I'm bald. You know what I mean? Cause all you see is this. I kind of like uh, my dog, Cody Davis from, I think uh, from, you know, one of the papers in the area. <laughs> <laughs> so right now, the way I look, I look like I'm a bald man, but I am not bald. I have hair. You feel me? I just have to go to the barber. Hey, um, it happens. I got to go to see my hairstylist. Read whatever you want into that. My hair right now, DJ, if I don't have gel, it goes down to here. <laughs> it is so long. I am delaying it as long as I possibly can because I have a wedding in a couple of weeks and there are now moments around the house if i don't have any stuff in there to hold it all up that i actually have to wear a headband because i cannot see <laughs> it's it's a problem okay all right well, when you go to the barber like you get like a number one number two number three like so usually it? close <laughs> on the sides and a lot on top Hey, I mean, we could go all day talking about my hairstylist, Annie, who is incredible. Yeah. This is the girl that I saw on a dance floor at a Christmas party that I grabbed with a candy cane that I went on two dates with. And eventually she became my hairstylist and therapist. She's been doing it for like 10 years. Crazy how things work like that. Definitely is the world of the barbershop. That's the game, sure, though. Speaking of worlds, let's travel to the world of the Houston Texans. <laughs> <laughs> so what are we seeing from the quarterbacks out there dj i know you, you were out there on tuesday on wednesday right we know that the texans are rotating davis mills and cj stroud but that right. this week was cj stroud's week to be the starting quarterback yeah i think this week again cj stroud is has been run with the ones it's kind of on cue what the Mika was talking about right each week They've been rotating. And last week, Dave was running with the ones. And the previous week, we saw uh, we saw more CJ that for that one practice that we went to during OTA. So it kind of lines up with each week. It just happens to, you know, it's one week is Davis, not the next week is CJ. I will say that today was a good test into his mental fortitude um, because there were some up and downs, right? They're in seven on seven. He starts off really well, and then he was – Two for three for the you know first three reps and the fourth rep got to drop pass. Then the next play when he finally gets back out there on the ones offense he throws a deep ball. Nico Collins, Derek Stingley breaks it up. Um, great play by Derek, slightly underthrown because he puts it out just a little bit further. Maybe we're talking about completely different ordeal for the day. Then goes the team goes four for four, completes all of his passes. He goes to the sideline. Then when the first team comes back out there, I want to say first or second play he throws a pick six to Eric Murray. I don't know if it's miscommunication because he threw it to a spot. Eric Murray's there, boom, intercepts it on the floor, gets up, runs it back for six. Like that would have been without question a touchdown. Uh, pick six, interception return for a touchdown without question. So now he's on the sidelines. Davis is out there. He makes his plays. Um, then they go two minute drill. CJ goes six for eight. And I'm including one of the, you know, the, the spikes. And throws a touchdown, 38, 12 seconds left. They had no timeouts. 38 from around, like, I want to say the 15th. Those are absolute dark over the middle touchdown. So you got to see the highs and lows from C.J. Shroud, um, where you have some good, you got some horrific, and then you got, you know, a bunch of in-between. So you were able to see the roller coaster that happens with rookie quarterbacks, but it was good for him to finish on a high note because that was as high as you can have it. You know what I'm saying? It's two minute drill, less than a minute and like 15 seconds. And it wasn't like they started on the 50 yard line. They started on like 25 
and he drove them all the way down and threw a touchdown on third and eight. We all know third third downs is the money down. What can you do? High pressure situations, and for him to deliver that was very encouraging. Um, there was one play that I wanted to also mention where it was it was like his first set of team beginning of practice where he gets a couple of completions, he got a first down, the second down, it's a sack, and then we get a false start from Larry Tunsil. So now it's second and 27. Next throw, dart right over the middle to Nico Collins for a first down. So that's what I'm talking about, the highs and the lows. There, there was – someone asked me, like, how would you categorize the day? I would say, like, above average because, again, if you throw a pick six, like, that's not – I can't, you know, pass by that. Interception, cool. Pick six, no, nah, that's points for the other team. You know what I mean? But overall, um, it was a um, above average to good day for C.J. Shroud. Um, I think, but I would say I think the reason why it's still a competition at this point, an honest competition, is because – neither has separated themselves, right? Like, you're kind of getting the same type of production offensively. It looks different, but the results look different. I mean, the results are roughly the same where Davis can move the ball, CJ can move the ball. Um, so that's why it's still quote-unquote competition. But in reality, if it's even, you go with the younger guy, the guy with more pedigree, and that obviously is CJ. To go to what you were saying earlier, and that answer – what you want to hear is that this guy's going to rebound when he makes mistakes. Right. Not every quarterback is capable of keeping themselves balanced, I guess. And again, this is different than a game. This is practice. So the stakes aren't as high as it would be in a situation like that. Specifically, say Stroud has a couple of bad games in a row. What? Right. I really want to see, though, from Stroud is a guy that's willing to push the football down the field and somebody that's also willing to, I guess, be bold enough to make a throw on, as you said, second and 27 or so that's actually past the sticks because that's what separates the great quarterbacks taken early from the worst quarterback taken early, the busts, if you will, the Mitchell Trubisky's, the Marcus Mariota's. You want a guy who's actually going to be unafraid of potential mistakes. I think as the league has gotten more offense-oriented and you see quarterback completion percentages skyrocketing over the last couple of decades, you've seen a lot of guys who are unwilling to throw the football in tight windows. And you can understand why with the way that college is, which these quarterbacks are being set up to throw to wide open players all the time. Yeah. So you got to shake that habit a little bit. And it sounds like at least to an extent that that's what we've been seeing out of Stroud at mini camp and at OTAs. Yeah, I agree. I, I, that's one thing. You made a good point. Like he's willing to throw in a tight window. There's one play um, during seven on seven. We trying to throw the tank Dell where it was tight, but like he threw it, with anticipation over the middle, I think the tank might have been running the seam route. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to say what coverage the Texans were in. I think I have an idea, but it was, you know, um, he throwing the ball over the seams, tank tried to get past the nickel defender and was able to, and see it through it before he got out of that, before you know he was able to shake free a little bit. And he was kind of throwing anticipation kind of into a small window because again, like the defense was gonna collapse pretty quickly into that little window, but see still fired it there. It was a touch. It was a tad or a tick early, which is why I felt incomplete. But that goes back to your point of CJ willing to make those type of throws. And you got to think that's one thing that's with guys like him come out of college, right, where you have usually every time you walk on the football field, your receiver is most likely – your receivers, what as are most likely better than the defensive backs that the other teams has, right? You basically have more talent than the opposite team. So that transition from college to NFL, some of those guys tend to be a little gun shy because they're not used to having to throw into tight windows. That was one issue that kind of played Tua Tagovailoa his first couple of years was, granted, his receivers didn't separate much at all, but he wasn't necessarily willing to fire and pull the trigger because in college, he was used to Waddle, Ruggs, Judy, Devonta Smith always being wide open. 
So that was kind of an adjustment for him. Kind of saw it a little bit with Zach, where his last year, he was literally like in college at BYU. His guys were always winning. So that was an adjustment to where he wasn't necessarily letting it rip all the time or trusting what he was seeing because what he was seeing was a little more was a little more crowded compared to what he was seeing at his last year at BYU. You see that a lot with quarterbacks coming in early where they're used to their guys being fairly open. Right. Um, that's what, you know, we had the issue with a lot of Oklahoma quarterbacks, Bama quarterbacks. Granted, you know, in hindsight, a lot of those Oklahoma and Bama quarterbacks just weren't talented enough to play in the NFL. Um, but those are things that they have to adapt to um, where you go from your guys always being wide open to right. now your guys, you got like, they're, they're this open, but that's open. So that's an adjustment, but it's good to see CJ still, even though his guys aren't always that open, he's still willing to fire it into the windows that he needs to be fired into. You mentioned also earlier the difference between Stroud and Mills. There haven't been many as far as the actual results. I guess for the few Mills and non folks out there that maybe are still holding on to hope, or maybe they're just waiting for preseason games to gamble on Davis Mills to throw for a ton of passing yards or something like that. I don't know. I feel like you got to be a real degenerate to be in on Davis Mills still. But uh, you you mentioned that it's been largely the same result. Why is that? Has Mills actually been looking all right out there? Yeah, yeah. Mills Mills has looked competent. And I think, you know, that's a credit to him. You know, he's been in the league three years. He's third offense, but he's a little competent. He understands where to go with football. He just doesn't, like, necessarily take those 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 risks that you would want to see at times um, that CJ will take. Um, you know, Mills is a lot more just methodical, whereas if this is open, I'm going to throw here. If not, I'm going to hit my check down. That's just who he is. That's how he is as a, as a quarterback. Um, but, again, like, he's been fairly methodical. He's been – uh, competent. He's been able to make plays. Um, I mean, he had some throws um, today. I think he had one to Alex Batchman that Alex Batchman was able to break for a big, a big, a big game, um, which resulted. I think I want to say the touchdown, but you know, I, you know, referee came, waved it off, blah, 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 whatever, whatever, whatever. But um, he's been competent. Like it, he's not. He hasn't given up the starting role to CJ. That's why it's still quote unquote a competition. Now like I don't want to say CJ hasn't taken it because it's still early. Um so I don't want to put that misnomer on him because then people can run with that and think like, oh CJ ain't looking good. Not necessarily that. Like CJ you see the talent, things of that nature. Um you see that both of them Mills has been this is his third year. Like he knows what the NFL game looks like. You know, so I was talking to one player today just overall by his development. And he just said, like, you know, go from year one to year two, I just – the game has slowed down for me. And I think Mills, the game has continued to slow down for him. So that's how he's able to still nip at CJ Charles feet. A lot of focus on the quarterbacks to this point, and we'll see where these two go. I, I know that you, DJ, have been very – very aware of Derek Stingley and what we've seen out of him thus far. I love what I've heard from you to this point. I know uh, Brooks Kavina in the Chronicle had an article about how maybe the scheme with D'Amico Ryans is going to make things a little bit easier for Stingley. And I definitely heard a little bit ago, you were mentioning the CJ Stroud drive downfield and throwing the ball Derek Stingley's way. What have we been seeing from the second year? Player who was third overall pick in last year's draft. Yeah. Um. Again, yeah. He's he looks like the talent that justified him being the number three overall pick. Coming off of, you got you got to realize like how good his film had to be for him to go ahead of Sauce, knowing what Sauce did that last year at college, where he basically erased everybody that was in front of him, and he had plays against J-Mo Williamson, who was. Jim was crushing everybody, and he had plays where plays where he held his own against J-Mo. Now, granted, um, he had a little more help because Mechie was hurt, so J-Mo was, was, you know, there is more attention to J-Mo versus where the, you have J-Mo and Mechie. You can't really lock in on one guy. But Sauce had a phenomenal – like, Sauce checked off every single box, and Sting still went ahead of him. Um, and he looks like the talent that – you understand why he went ahead of him. Now, will he be viewed as better after 2022? I mean, 2023, 
that we'll see because at the end of the day, like Sauce has had a, I mean, he was all pro, first team all pro as a rookie. So like, you got to give credit where credit's due and he earned that. I can't even act like he didn't earn that. Sauce was phenomenal as a rookie. But Stingley, again, when I mentioned about just the projection and talent, like you're seeing that, you know what I mean? I mean, again, like I've seen probably like, I want to say like five, six passes thrown his way and they've all been incomplete. I mean, they're all falling incomplete. You know what I mean? Like, Every single one is falling incomplete in some capacity. As people you drop, whatever, like it just hasn't resulted in the way that a quarterback would want when he throws at Derek Stingley. Um, and I remember talking to a player the other day. We obviously we weren't at this practice where he made an instinctual pass breakup that resulted in everybody on defense getting hyped. So Stingley um, looks like he looks like what a number one quarterback looks was supposed to look like right now. And, you know, I really trust my eyes when it comes to cornerback play. Obviously, uh, you know, when we get a training camp, we'll be able to see more. But right now, you know, he's been answering all the calls, been answering all the bells. And he's one of the reasons why I think that the Texans' defensive unit, which was 27th or worse in either scoring or total defense, could be a top 18 unit in 2023. Mainly because you added a scheme, the secondary, a premier type corner and a potential good pass rush. Yeah, I think that the, the unit can go from 27 to 28, whatever it was last year, to um, top 18. And you also got to remember, as bad as they were against stopping the run, they only allowed 24 points per game, which, yeah, sure, that's, a, that, that's, that's still towards the bottom of 27. But, like, the margins are very small in that capacity. Because I was looking – I remember I was debating with somebody – about uh, the Jets and Patriots defense, right? And we looked at scoring defense, and one was the Jets were 18th in terms of points allowed per game, 18 points allowed per game. They were second, I believe. And then the Patriots were, I believe, 10th or something like that, but they allowed 20 points per game. So the margins are really, really small in that capacity. Um, and so then, they, yeah, the, the Texans gave up 24 points per game, but they're also playing behind a struggling offense, which – you know, on the field more often, more opportunities for a team to score points. So the Texan defense, as porous as it was at times, isn't that far off because I always remember that they were keeping them in a the game for the majority of the season. Like, how many games came down to, like, just offense? You know that, that right. meme of, like, the, the cartoon poking something? Hey, do something. Do like something. That, that's kind of how the offense was at times last year. Like, hey, can you do something? Um, because the defense was doing their part. Um, obviously, you know, they had games where – they got shredded, like, you know, the Miami game or the Mahomes game. But, like, even that game, they kept the Texans' offense in it long enough to where, I mean, obviously, you know, we saw what happened in the overtime. There was no fumbles. Next play, give a scoring touchdown to um, uh, McKinney, McKendrick, or whatever his name is. Um, but, um, yeah, that's basically where I'm at with Sting. That's why I believe in the secondary at potential top 10 unit. So I believe that the, the defense overall can be a top 18 unit because they're going to be able to have a legitimate strength, which is going to be their secondary led by Derek Stingley and Jalen Petrie. Defensive line in the pass rush, you mentioned a little bit earlier. And I, I saw you tweeting at somebody who was asking about how Will Anderson looked. Really not so much you can gauge based off of what they're doing in minicamp, I'm assuming, because I'm – it's not training camp. Training camp is when they will occasionally, not every practice, but let these guys go after each other in full pad. So I'm guessing there's not a lot new on the Will Anderson front, but there is this new on the Houston Texans front, and this happened a little bit earlier this afternoon. They extended one of their key defensive line pieces, Malik Collins, with a two-year $23 million extension, $20 million of it guaranteed it's another extension for collins in the nick casario era 2021 seven qb hits nine tackles for a loss last year 10 QB hit nine tackles for a loss he is now joined by sheldon rankins from the jets hassan bridgeway from the 49ers this is the one guy on the defensive line last year that seemed like he belonged, and I hate to be blunt, in the league. 
mm-hmm. the Texans defensive line at times last year combined with really slow linebacker play is the main reason that they were just wretched, specifically against the run all year long. So, okay, you're hoping that the help around him can maybe get more out of Millie Collins, who clearly DJ is a player that the Texans like a lot. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I remember – now, grant, granted, like, when you look at the, just the raw stats, like, it might not necessarily, like, make the case in his favor. Um, but, like, the eye test-wise, when he was out there, they were a better unit, again, at stopping the run. Like, for example, um, I pulled, you know, I pulled up some of the stats from ESPN metrics that even though, yeah, they allowed a lot of yards on the ground, like a lot, six most in NFL history. Um, when he was on the field, their success rate was 57% versus their success rate being 53% when he was off the field at stopping the run. I got another stat for you. So um, they were bad. Obviously, they were bad at stopping the run, but, like, they were still, like, like it wasn't – falling off the cliff type bad. Uh, and I remember he got hurt against the against the Raiders. So he got hurt against the Raiders. I think that game, Josh Jagger went for like 143, 45 yards rushing. The next game, he missed that game, the chest issue. The next game, Lake misses that game. Derrick Henry comes to town. And Derrick Henry ran for 219 yards and two <laughs> touchdowns. You know what I mean? Like, like Malik Collins was that was that valuable in that sense that like when Malik was out there, they were a much better unit at stopping the run, especially interiorly. Obviously, you know, he's not on the edge, so he can't, there's not that much control he has over there. But in terms of stopping the run in the interior, he was a very key component. And I you know, I recognized that last year. Um, and it was it was very uh, it was very coincidental that the second he got hurt, they allowed Derrick Henry to run for 219 yards, which at that time was the most allowed in the NFL game for that season. And obviously he was back when they played him the second time. And yes, Derrick Henry still had that one run where he went for like 48 yards, but he, oh, I think it was like second possession, but he finished with 226 yards rushing. So if you obviously do the math, 126 minus 48, um, that's 78 yards on 22 carries, which do the math again, that is 3.5 yards per attempt, and that, which is why they're able to win that game because they were able to obviously slow down their running attack because their whole offense goes through their Henry and Money Collins played a big, big, big factor into that. So locking him up, got got Will Anderson. We'll see about locking up Grenard or Jerry Hughes based on how they do, and same with Sheldon based on how he, how he does. I'm really not saying I'm super high on the defensive line, but I know the defensive line won't be an issue in 2022, I mean, 2023. And a lot of it really just had to come down also to putting guys in the positions to succeed. And I just don't know if Lovey Smith's scheme necessarily helped, helped that in, in, in that, in, you know, in all honesty, um, just based on asking guys to do certain things. Um, so obviously I won't be, I won't, we really go too deep into detail on that. Don't want to bore people, but um, yeah. And I think with Demigo Ryan's scheme, allowing their defensive line to rush upfield and create havoc and basically reset line of scrimmages for the offensive line, and then create holes for the linebackers to blitz through to you know make tackles out of the backfield or at the line of scrimmage, things of that nature. I think they'll be able to have a much better showcase in 2023 versus 2022. I know with Anderson on the edge, it's going to be intriguing to see what he does with those guys that you mentioned in the middle. The second level is what I really wonder about because, all right, they bring in Denzel Perriman and you're probably expecting him to be middle linebacker. Maybe maybe he's not. I'm curious as to where Christian Harris is going to line up, a guy who is trying to run like a cheetah out there, he said. It seems uh, like... That's the guy that D'Amico Ryans is probably looking at and licking his chops the most, thinking about all the things he can do with him. I know, DJ, there are certain things you can and can't say as far as where he's lining up, but I, I wonder how they are going to use him in conjunction with those guys 
because it does feel like there's going to be a rather large change at linebacker based off of the unit last year. I, I think, you know, looking at the roster right now and cap cash with these, like Christian Kirk's, he's a rather likely one by the, by the start of the regular season, at least just based off of the amount of money he's making and based off the way that he played last year. Now with Christian Harris, I, I, I wonder where they use him. Do they, do they keep him on the weak side? Do they have him on the strong side? I do know that that speed, though, is much needed. They're going to need him out there a lot more, and hopefully he'll be healthy all off season so we can actually start the season with the team. Yeah, I think um, we asked Amico about that yesterday, and he said that the position is basically interchangeable with the linebacker spot. you got to be able to play strong, middle, and, and weak. Um, I think Christian for sure can play weak and strong because of that speed and middle. Same with um, Denzel. So all so all those guys will be able to play all three spots. Um, so far, we've been seeing reps of Kirksey with the ones with Christian and Henry Toto. Same way, you know, since I see Denzel in that middle part, surrounded by those two, um, and Christian Harris and Toto. Like Toto is actually running a lot with the ones. You know, honestly, yeah. um, yeah, he's running a lot with the ones. So. We see how the development goes. I don't think Christian Kirk should be a cap casualty. Not because they can't save money, but so one of my issues with my my concerns with the Texans, they don't need depth. So like injuries will happen. It's football. Injuries will happen. What spots? Like the only spot where I feel like they have legitimate depth is secondary, right? Because right. like if Jimmy gets hurt, Eric Murray can go out there, he can hold it down. Jalen's out. Eric Murray can cut. He can, he can step in and make, you know, and, and, and hold it down and be com- comparable. Let's say Steven is out. Let's say miss a game or whatever. You can put in Shaq Griffin. You know what I'm saying? Or if Sting is out, you can put in Shaq Griffin at, at the other spot. You got Steven and Shaq, and they're solid, you know, they're quality, proven starting veterans. Um, or you could put Denzel and uh, Desmond King outside and put Tavier in the, in the nickel, and things won't necessarily miss that much of a beat. D-line and linebacker is where it gets a little bit different because we saw what injuries did to the unit last year, and I don't think scheme alone can necessarily change that where now it's, oh, plug and play, and there won't be much of a drop-off like there obviously would be. So I think you have to keep a guy like Christian Kirksey. One, he's a good locker room guy. He's really good in the community. Um He's like basically that the Walter Payton guy. He can keep everything together. Um, and again, like if he's your backup, cool. If you started, cool. You know what I'm saying? Like they don't like if you go through the list, all right, you got Denzel, you got Corey, you got Kirksey, Toto, Christian Harris, Blake Cashman. Um, I feel like I'm missing somebody, but whoever I'm missing, you know, that's that. Like that, that that's a solid six. But if you cut Kirksey now, and let's say Terry, uh, Henry Toto is like a backup or whatever, and you make him a starter and he's not ready, now things get a little trickier. You know what I mean? So that's why I'm like, you're better off keeping Kirksey because, like, your options aren't that good. It's not like you have a bunch of, like, draft picks that not he's true. sitting in front of. You know what I mean? Let's say you would have had, like, a second and third and maybe another fourth-round pick guy, guys that you've used, like, that you had – that Kirk's is taking reps away from. Who's Kirk's really taking reps away from outside of like Christian Harris and maybe Harry Toe Toe? Like, is that worth cutting him and then like now having whoever you're going to have backing him up when we saw last year what that looked like? You know what I mean? The same with like the D line. Like, okay, I like the first five, right? Jonathan Gennard, Malik, Sheldon, Hughes, Will. But injuries happen. People get tired, got to rotate. So what does that look like then, right? Now you're going. Like we'll see. You know what I'm like, like they like the D line and a lot of our part still needs a talent infusion. They still need more talent added to it. So like getting rid of proven veterans, I don't know if that's a good idea. I get what you're saying there. Yep. I, I think what changes is in the preseason and in training camp, guys actually start getting cut. So you might have alternatives. So it really does depend on what happens in August. And you are right, not a lot of depth there. But I also feel like they could probably find somebody come training camp that maybe is a better player than Kirksey. Again, we'll see. Um, as far as the linebacker core goes, it's just better this year, which is really the most important thing at, at this moment in time. 
Uh, as far as other notes, DJ, that I saw coming out that maybe you comment a little bit more on. I'm just going to go through a couple of them really quickly. Go ahead. Uh, Kenyon Green, the other Texans first round pick last year, the guard out of Texas A&M, had offseason knee surgery. D'Amico Ryans was asked about Kenyon Green, who wasn't out there. And Ryan said, we'll see where he is at training camp. I think he's always going to be like Nick Casario, someone who keeps things essentially close to the vest and people like you and me and the media, you know, he's just going to feed them bleep and keep them in the dark, both the departed. Um, but does it make me feel good that green is again, missing what we all believe to be valuable off season time, especially as they install another new offense. Yeah. Um, obviously injuries happen and ain't nothing to do about it. Um, he just has to, Kangri has all the talent in the world. Um, I, if I was him or if I was someone in his camp, I would tell him to look at um, Makai Becton, right? So both amazing talents, both special type talents that you have to, you're going to ride it out with. But Makai dealt with injuries in that, you know, with the Jets. And obviously, um, you know, they, they run the same scheme, right? So like there's there's certain things that they're gonna be asked to do similar things and things of that nature. That's when I put that out there, give the proper, proper context. And that, you know, Makai had initially had issues. I don't want to say picking up the scheme. I don't know if it's that, but just not being in the best shape and taking care of his body in the best possible way. So when the season came around, um, but see, you know, when the training cat came around, he had his ups and downs, things of that nature from a fitness standpoint. Um and then obviously he got he got hurt. Like obviously, like, you know, he's been hurt the past couple of years, and obviously those things are kind of out of his control. Things happen, um, and then obviously they declined his fifth year option, and now he's on a proven deal. He looks great now, and I think he's gonna have a really good year. But that things can change for you really quickly on a new st- under a new staff, especially in this scheme. That if you're not ready to go, they will move on from you and mm-hmm. keep it pushing, or at least plan to move on from you and keep pushing. So that's what, you know, I would, if I was in this camp, be like, yo, look at this example, right? Where like, they basically got to the point where it's like, yeah, we're going to decline your options to prove a year. If you ball, we'll bring you back. If you don't ball, we're going to move on. So I would kind of look at, at that example. It was like, hey, make sure you're doing whatever it takes to get your knee right. So when it comes down to training camp, you're ready to go. Because one thing about this tree, while they're all player friendly and all player coaches like Mike LaFleur, then I'm, yeah, Matt LaFleur, Robert Sala, Mike McDaniels, um, Demico Ryans, um, they're guys that are no nonsense, right? And you better be out like, like they're respected to choose like grown men, but availability is the best ability, and they will for sure knock you for not being available. So, you know, not panic time yet. Not panic time at all, but just needs to make sure that he's ready to go by training camp because things he's not a rookie anymore. So like that rookie excuse is no longer there. Um, you just gotta be ready to go in all capacity because this scheme they're gonna ask a lot of you. They're gonna ask a lot of for you to you have a lot of you them. So got to make sure that the knees right, fitness is right, all that. Not saying I don't, I don't think he's out of shape or anything like that. I'm just generally speaking um, because if you're not ready to go. These coaches will for sure. Get somebody else in there that's ready and not think twice, especially in this game. John Mechie is also a second year player that had injury issues and, of course, right. recovering from leukemia to deal with last year. So, this is essentially his rookie year. D'Amico Ryan's also asked about his status. He's on track to be ready to go at training camp. So, I know there's not a lot, DJ, to go off of as far as what he's doing out on the field. I'll ask instead, as far as the wide receivers go, is there a definitive number one in a group that obviously lost Brandon Cooks this offseason? Definitive? Nah. Like, Nico's made some plays, but it's OTAs and mandatory minicamp. Like, like, I can't definitively say, oh, yeah, he's a number one wide receiver. Like, nah. Because I've seen this before. Like, again, like, when I was covering the Jets, you know, I know I keep going back to that, but I can only go off what I was covering. Hey, like the OTAs and mandatory minicamp, 
The number one receiver was Keenan Cole for Zach Wilson. It was Keenan Cole slash Elijah Moore. Neither one led the team in receiving yards that year. It was Corey Davis. You know what I mean? Um, and Corey Davis is kind of like that Robert Woods type guy in the sense of like he's very familiar with the scheme, wouldn't do dirty work. Like Corey Davis didn't really make much noise throughout OTs and mandatory minicamp. And he wasn't even, I mean, he didn't, he didn't show up that much during that 2021 year, but he, he did for mandatory and things like that. And, you know, Elijah looked like the guy during the time. But again, when the season came around, Corey Davis was the number one wide receiver. So um, I wouldn't say there's anybody that's a, that's definitively the guy, right? Like, like everybody's comfortable. Everybody does different things. Everybody's very comparable to where, like, like last year we knew what our question was. Brandon Cooks at practice, she saw the things he was doing. Like it was, like he was, he was creating explosive plays a lot. It was unfortunate we couldn't see it in the games. At least he was creating a lot of explosive plays in practice. We just haven't seen that. Like. Like, I'm not going to be willing to jump on and like, oh, yeah, Nico's going to be the number one receiver um, over Robert Woods or even over John Mechie. Well, I don't even want to put John Mechie in that number one wide receiver core, uh, um, discussion yet. Because, one, that's a lot to ask, and that's unfair. Yeah. The man tore his ACL in 2021, had cancer in 2022. Nah, I'm cool off of, like, putting that type of burden expectation on him. Because I'm like, oh, yeah, when he come back, he's going to be number one receiver, and he's not, like, now people looking at me like I'm crazy for even su- suggesting that. You know what I mean? Um, so, no, nah, there isn't a definitive no more wide receiver. CJ and Nico do have a good connection. Um, and we'll see what that turns into. You know what I mean? We'll see what Robert Woods turns into. You know, I'm very weary of, like, calling, like, rece- like, receivers number one guys unless, like, they have a proven pedigree throughout um, their career, like, like I could say, like last year when the Dolphins got Tyreek Hill, he's gonna be the number one wide receiver. Oh, perfect example, perfect example. Boom. Last year during mandatory minicamp OTAs, when I was covering the Jets, Garrett Wilson was barely like making plays. Straight up, like he was barely making plays. Like he was. I remember talking to a coach, and they told me he was uh, like he was swimming, like he was swimming trying to keep his head above water at that point. And what happened by the end of the year? Real offensive rookie of the year. Like, like Mar Chase, you saw, you saw the catch. talent. Yeah, you saw the talent, but like he still had to ways to go. And by the end of the year, Ricky, offensive rookie of the year. So like I'm always like, when it comes to like when there's no definitive guy, not ready to crown anybody until it's time to actually crown somebody. Because going in training camp, it looked like based off of the reports, I wasn't there anymore. I was in Houston. It looked like again in New York, Elijah Moore was going to be the number one wide receiver, and then boom. It was Garrett Wilson by game two when he scored a two touchdown game when he touched on against the Cleveland Browns. All right, boom. He's the guy. So sometimes you just kind of let guy let that fest around and play itself out when you have the questions that the room has in terms of who's going to be the guy. So that's where I'm at when it comes to Nico Collins, Robert Woods, Tank, Noah Brown, everybody in that, in that, in that dimension in that facility. Just kind of got to let it play out since there's no definitive guy based off a resume. Smart way to look at it. I, I love that Garrett Wilson comparison. And it is funny. I remember vividly with the Cincinnati Bengals and Jamar Chase. Oh, they should have drafted Penny Stool. Joe Burrow's going to die. Yep, and then yep, Jamar yep. Chase just destroys from week one on with the yep. Bengals. Yep. Uh, one last thing, DJ, to wrap this thing up. J.J. Watt. He has been officially named a member of the Texans Ring of Honor. The ceremony to make it happen is going to take place October 1st against the Pittsburgh Steelers. I think that's pretty cool because that means J.J. Watt's brother uh, will be here at NRG Stadium for that. I imagine the entire Watt clan will be there for that as well. As a guy who was first in Houston the same year that that JJ came here. He came here in April. I came here in October of 2011. It's pretty crazy to see where his career went from the pick six after a okay rookie season against the Bengals in the playoffs to an incredible 2012. Those ridiculous 2014 2015 seasons where he also was the defensive player of the year and was actually a legitimate MVP candidate in 2015 because he kept on scoring touchdowns in addition. This guy's the best defensive player, DJ, that I've ever seen. I think he's the best defensive player that a lot of people in Houston will ever see, unless they're 
getting NFL Sunday taken and watching Aaron Donald every single Sunday. And as far as the actual Texans Ring of Honor going forward, I don't think anyone that we've seen play for this roster over the 20 plus years of the franchise's history really qualify. It's JJ Watt, it's, it's Andre Johnson. I feel like we're lowering the bar a little bit if we're adding anybody else in. But Watt had just a tremendous impact on this city, Hurricane Harvey, which I was here for as well. And I'm happy for him. And, and more importantly, DJ, I think the Texans just continue to stack off season wins. And I know a lot of fans are frustrated, but bringing J.J. Watt back into the fold after he essentially was impressed to continue playing here, big move from D'Amico Ryan to this point. I think that they have done a lot of, hey, look at them. They're not the worst anymore moves. <laughs> that's that's what you're looking for when you're at rock bottom. Yeah, I mean, I remember watching J.J. a bunch as a kid. Uh, watching the Texans because, you know, I, it's funny, you know, people say they're a dysfunctional franchise, but for a while they were, like, literally, like, always in the playoffs or winning the AFC South. Like, I think they, they won the AFC South six years where J.J. was a member. I think yeah. uh, he was a, he was a, he was a Texan for 10 seasons, right? And mm -hmm. they won the AFC South six times. Um, so we saw a bunch of games and, like, J.J. was – Incredibly, you mentioned MV, um, a legitimate MVP candidate. Yeah, I think who wanted that year? Aaron Rodgers, right? Yes. Yeah, like that's who held him off from getting MVP. And I think it was deservedly so. And you made a really good point. Like, JJ is a no brainer in terms of like Ring of Honor. I'm glad he did it this year instead of waiting. Um, get him in there now. Uh, because people are going to keep asking, like, where are you going to put him? Where are you going to put him in? Where are you going to put him in? Right. And it's good that, uh, you know, the Texans have a uh, historic, like, you know, some franchises, they don't really have a historic player. He is legitimately, like, a historic player. Like, like, like he's a legitimate, like, one of the best offensive linemen to ever play the game. You know what I'm saying? He's, he's, he's one of three players to be named Defensive Player of the Year three times. He's on the short list with guys like Aaron Donald and Lawrence Taylor. Uh, yeah. Like, like, when you say, like, that's the best defensive player you've ever seen, like, I can't even push back. Because it's like it's not like you said like I don't know like, I guess for the sake of discussion I mean I don't know like maybe you said like some just a perennial Pro Bowl guy was the best defensive end you've ever seen you know you said you said like JJ Watt like, I'm all right for sure you know yeah what I mean? like <laughs> like like uh you know I think Aaron Donald was better defensive player but again like that's not that's the split that's literally splitting hairs in that capacity but it's cool that he's gonna be week four early in the season against the Pittsburgh Steelers, there'll still be a lot of buzz in the building at that point. Cause it could be based off of their early schedule, they could be two and two. Like as we thought, they could be two and one going into that game. Maybe one and two, could they get Ravens, Jags, and Colts prior to that game. I think I got the Colts and I think I have Colts and uh Jags mixed up. But regardless, like they could be two and one going into that game and the buzz in that building will be electric. You know what I'm saying? It's yeah. Big day. Uh, that's going to be a fun day to cover in its full capacity. So He's come a long way, too. He once was unbelievably corny and that rubbed some people the wrong way. I think he was being his authentic self. I think he's become a lot more down-to-earth in the years since then, and I've enjoyed that transformation, too. He's been a huge part of it. And, I mean, shoot, if you think of the Houston Texans, he was the Houston Texans over the last decade, DJ. You mentioned the playoff years, 11 12, uh, 15, 16, and 18, and 19. And there were some really impressive years. I, I think the big, the big regret that I have for him is the injuries. Because if not for the injuries, you got to wonder if this is a guy that was, even at age 33, maybe approaching 20, uh, 200 sacks or something like that with the way that he started things off. Yeah, he yeah. He slowed down a little right, bit after that. Right. Because after the, one of those, those I think, 20-sack years, he had, like, back-to-back -back years where he was injured the majority of the week. Missed the yeah. So, like, imagine – I think he's at 114. So, imagine if he plays the majority of those two years. Like, we're talking about a guy that's at 140. Mm -hmm. 100, 140 or 100 and, like, 30-ish. You know what I mean? Um, like, 200 is kind of – it's crazy. Like, people are close to 200. We have Bruce Smith who actually eclipsed 200, which is absolutely cool to see. Uh, I think maybe Reggie White did too. Uh, I can't think of the numbers on top of my head. 
But yeah, nah, you're right. You know what I'm saying? Like without the injuries, maybe he keeps he keeps playing. Maybe he tries to go after those type of numbers because whoo we he yeah. was a bad man, dog. Like that was a special generational type player, you know what I mean? Like generation like, he was legitimately generational. We haven't seen many like that ever. So it's a shame. You, you know, you look at the last uh from twenty sixteen to twenty twenty two, his last uh, seven years of his career. He he played three full seasons. His last full season, he had 12 and a half sacks. But yeah, just three games in 16, in 17, five, in 19, eight, and in 2021, just seven. But we're all happy for J.J. Watt. Very cool to see him officially honored and the Texans to continue to stack up public relation W's. Anyway, that's going to wrap up today's edition, this week's edition of the Talking Texans podcast. Make sure that you're checking out DJ Bienname's great work for ESPN.com, covering the Texans. He's been boots on the ground for mini camp for OTAs. This is a guy you got to be following. I'm the one that's just basically reading about what he tweets and reacting based off of that. I can't wait to eventually get out there. For training camp and if you want to catch more of my stuff it's the paul galan show espn 97.5 and 92.5 weekdays from 10 to noon we have a podcast as well he's dj i'm paul have yourselves a wonderful week